So with my apologies uh, for those who were here with us earlier this morning, I'm going to sort of begin again uh, with the formal welcome. Uh, my name is Dan Cederbaum, and I have the pleasure and honor of being the executive director of the Mordechai M. Kaplan Center for Jewish Peoplehood. A number of folks, not surprisingly, have asked me, what is this Kaplan Center? Uh, for now, all I'm going to say is there's some things in the front of the program you may want to look at, and www.kaplancenter.org, O-R-G. Um, in particular, although there's much more important stuff on our front page, notably uh, uh, my colleague Mel Skultz and uh, Eric Kaplan's first uh, commentaries on a central text from Kaplan, uh, there is also an essay from me of a sort uh, called Why a Kaplan Center, and that'll answer some of the questions I know people are already asking. So again, www.kaplancenter.org. It is a, we're doing, I don't know if this is a made up term, what I call a soft launch of the website, meaning we think it's good enough for folks to look at. We welcome your comments. A number of the links are not yet fully functional. I must note that the support us link is fully functional. <laughs> so uh, just a little hint if you enjoy what is to come today, because people keep saying, how can you not charge for this? <laughs> and uh, it's a good question. Um, the end of, end of commercial. Um, so it is, uh, again, our pleasure uh, from the Kaplan Center point of view uh, to be um, engaged in a wonderful partnership uh, with the Program for Jewish Civilization here at Georgetown University and with the Department of Jewish Studies uh, at uh, McGill University in bringing to you the conference on the life, work, and legacy of Rabbi Mordechai M. Kaplan as the title architect of the Jewish future suggests, although we're, of course, very interested in the past and in the present. Uh, we're mostly interested in talking about Kaplan's relevance for the future, not only of North American Judaism, but Judaism throughout the world, and particularly in Israel, uh, beyond North America. Um, some important quick words of thanks, uh, again, to my partners, uh, Dr. Skult, Dr. Kaplan. Special word of thanks to our uh, other board member, uh, Jack Wolofsky, who's here. Uh, it was really Jack's initial conversations with Professor Jacques Berliner Blau, whom you'll hear from in just a moment, that gave birth to this conference. And so we all want to thank Jack uh, Wolofsky for, um, for the genesis of particularly our being here at Georgetown, which has been wonderful. <clears throat> we are dedicating this conference uh, to the memories of two great Reconstructionist thinkers and two of my most uh, important teachers, Rabbi Jack Cohen and Rabbi Ludwig Nadelman, Zichron Nam Livracha. Their memories will indeed always be for a blessing, and I'm thrilled that Daniel Nadelman, one of Rabbi Nadelman's sons, has joined us from New York. I'm also thrilled that we have two of uh, Mordechai Kaplan's granddaughters, Miriam Eisenstein and Anne Eisenstein, for those who don't know, sitting uh, in the middle here, and uh, another member of the Kaplan family, David Browse down from New Jersey, and we may be joined by one or more others. I apologize if I'm leaving uh, anybody out, but it's wonderful to have the uh, sort of personal, real legacy, <laughs> physical legacy of Mordechai Kaplan here with us, uh, as well as the intellectual legacy. So uh, before we turn to our panel, I want to invite uh, Professor Jacques Berliner Blau, the director of the Program for Jewish Civilization, here to say a few words. Uh, thank you all very much. I'm so happy you've all come out to the Hilltop today. Uh, my name is Jacques Berlinerblau. I'm an associate professor and the director for the program of Jewish Civilization at Georgetown University. There's so many people to thank. Excuse me, one second. And I'm back. There's so many people to thank. Um, I want to start by thanking our partners at the Mordecai Kaplan Center. I want to thank my dear colleague, Dr. Eric Kaplan, who gave a, a stem winder of a talk on uh, Mordecai Kaplan on January 27th, kind of an amuse-gueule, as they'd say in French, an appetizer for what we're doing today. Uh, the Program for Jewish Civilization was established in 2003 and 2004, and it is the brainchild of the person you heard this morning, and I think he does deserve a hefty round of applause. That is Rabbi Harold White. Um, so we have Kaplanian DNA. It's in our name. It's something we teach. It's something we believe in. Uh, we run a variety of programs. If you're curious, please go to our website, pjcmedia.org. You will see interviews with heads of state and Congress people and theologians and journalists and scholars. You'll see a lot of our students at work. Very, very briefly, we are the only unit of its kind that is located in the School of Foreign Service. So some of our intellectual interests include American Middle Eastern foreign policy, 
Holocaust and genocide studies. Um, we also work on the traditional Jewish studies fair, you might say, the good stuff, right? The Bible, the Talmud, the religious learning, so on and so forth. A couple of final remarks before we get moving. Uh, when we planned the program for Jewish civilization about a decade ago, and we feel we're going to center status very, very soon, this is precisely what we had in mind. Um, 225, 230 people on the hilltop listening to some of the finest, finest scholars discussing one of the most important figures in 20th century Judaism. I can't imagine anything better than that. That's why we did this, and I feel that uh, our dream is in the process of being vindicated. Couple of quick notes. Uh, you are our guests at Georgetown. If there's anything we can do to help you out, do not be shy to come speak to the Georgetown folks. We have tags like this that tend to say Georgetown on them. Uh, Ms. Audrey Anderson in the back is responsible for having organized all of this. And there is absolutely. We're very big on food. There'll be fruit salad. There'll be cookies. There'll be food, 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 and coffee. Don't worry. It's coming, and there's plenty back there. Uh, the associate director is Melissa Weinberg Spence, who is also overseeing everything. She's right by the coffee over there. And the very last person I will mention is our esteemed uh, rabbi now, and that is Rabbi Rachel Gartner, who's standing way in the back. More Kaplinian DNA. What can I say? Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you, all of you. And I just want to add my thanks again to both to Jacques, to Audrey, to Melissa, and to the wonderful students who have helped. We had a fun afternoon proofreading programs all together on Friday here. So with that, we turn to our uh, long-anticipated keynote uh, panel uh, titled Kaplan, Heschel, and the Future of North American Judaism. With apologies to these amazingly distinguished scholars, as I said this morning, we're not reading bios at all in the interest of time. They're in the program. But it's truly my delight to introduce uh, Dr. Mel Skull, Dr. Susanna Heschel, and Mel will speak first. Buber famously stated that all real living was meeting or encounter. So I want to begin with an encounter between Heschel and Kaplan at the seminary in 1952. It was just about the time that I was entering Cap Heschel's class in philosophy. And Kaplan writes in his diary, both of us wanted to discuss matters pertaining to the disparities in our philosophies of life and Judaism. The upshot of our differences is this. He seems to accept the conclusions of historical research and is on the whole no more and no less mystically than I am. Whereas I believe in stressing freedom and release from whatever is archaic and outworn, as well as affirming what is true and acceptable, he contends that we should confine ourselves to the affirmations. He maintains that my disciples flaunt my negatives. I think that's true, and I have been guilty, and I am going to try today not to flaunt Kaplan's negatives, but to concentrate on the affirmations. So let me go back to the seminary, to my own encounter with Heschel, which was not an I thou, because I was a student in Heschel's class. I studied philosophy with Heschel for three years. I never studied with Kaplan. But the point is that we didn't study Jewish philosophy. We did not study the Rambam. We did not study Yehuda Levi. We studied Heschel. I was upset at that time, and I must confess, I still am, because Heschel knew the Rambam. He had written on the Rambam, and I was looking forward as a major in philosophy to studying that with Heschel. And so I've had to learn that on my own. Heschel had a very young aspect. He had no beard, and neither did I. And he was not well known at that time. We read Man is Not Alone, chapter by chapter. The amazement, the wonder, the radical amazement that there is anything at all. The mystery of being. Heschel raised our consciousness but I got a low grade. And I think I got a low grade because I didn't understand what it meant to talk about the meaning beyond the mystery 
or mystery as an ontological category. Kaplan has a wonderful, wonderful word to thingify, which is to indicate that we turn uh, processes into entities. And I think that's what's happening here with the sense of mystery, which is an intellectual perception and is turned into a thing. I have spent 40 years studying Kaplan, 40 years wandering in the desert of Kaplan's prose. <laughs> Charles Silberman, Zichrono Libracha, famously said, well, he actually didn't want it repeated, but I have permission from his son, who I think is in the audience, that you could never quote a complete Kaplan sentence because there always were too many subordinate clauses. <laughs> we need Heschel. Kaplan people need Heschel, and we need him deeply. We need his poetry. We need his sense of mystery. We need his sense of the ineffable. We need to be awakened. We would benefit enormously from a tighter connection with Heschel. Heschel people need Kaplan. And Kaplan's understanding of the emphasis on the self, on choice, especially with reference to mitzvot, on the pragmatic and on creativity, especially with reference to the liturgy. So I think that they complement each other. It is as if we have two realms represented by two circles, and these circles overlap. There is a middle ground which they share. Each has a separate area that they don't share. Those of you who are familiar with logic will recognize this as a Venn diagram, which I think beautifully represents Kaplan and Heschel in their relationship. So I want to detail the sharing and to indicate the separate. To put it in another way, my thesis is that they both want the same thing, but they are different in terms of vocabularies. Richard Rorty famously used the concept of vocabulary as a philosophical principle. And that raises the whole issue of communication. Heschel and Kaplan basically did not understand each other. There is much misunderstanding between them. And the reason is, it's my very strong conviction, I don't know how Susanna feels, that they didn't read each other. They didn't study each other. We studied them, but they didn't study each other. They heard about each other, and they grasped each other by hearsay. They didn't really understand the depth of each other's thought, and I would like to help to bring them to that understanding. I want to be honest, and so Kaplan once said something to me which I am embarrassed about. He said, the ineffable, it means you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I was embarrassed by that remark. Heschel talked about customs, which is the way Kaplan understood the halakha, and he talked about customs and ceremonies. We studied customs and ceremonies in Hebrew school. The concept of custom is a strong sociological concept. William James is not only sociological, but it's philosophical. William James talked about habit, and that's really what Kaplan meant when he talked about the way of bringing up your children so they had Jewish habits, and if they had those habits, they would never give them up. So custom, although it allows for choice, it is, very, it is a very, very strong category. I want Kaplan and Heschel to visit each other they lived in different realms, they used different vocabularies, and they sometimes did visit, and I want to make that visiting uh, more often. They seem to be polar opposites. Kaplan is the Brogazer Misnagid, as uh, Schechter called him, the uh, angry opponent of Hasidism, and Heschel is the would-be Hasidic master. My understanding is that the relatives in Brooklyn wanted him to be a Hasidic master even after he came to America. Um, 
Now, uh, Heschel wanted to move from our consciousness, from self-centeredness, from the self-centeredness of modern life to God-centeredness. Kaplan advocated a Copernican revolution to move our attention from God-centeredness to self-fulfillment as the goal of meaning of religion. Heschel talks of our being asked as a reaction to wonder. Kaplan also felt the ethical impulse, the importance of being asked. We are obviously asked in many ways. We are asked by our reason. We are asked by our roles in society. The mother is asked by the nature of the case in her obligations to her children. The supernatural is not the only way. We are asked in all kinds of ways. Just a word about their life. It's well to remember, in considering uh, Kaplan and Heschel, that Kaplan was 25 years older than Heschel. And so I think in terms of considering the relationship, there's something of the ethical, of the Oedip <laughs> Oedipal here. <laughs> Interesting kind of slip, I guess uh, Sigmund would like that. They both wanted the same thing. Heschel talked about the goal of religion as the transformation of the individual. Self-transcendence. He wrote, the great premise of religion is that man is able to surpass himself. The goal of religion for Heschel. For Kaplan, it is self-fulfillment as he calls it, or salvation. These two concepts of self-transcendence and self-fulfillment are very, very close to each other. They overlap. And there is an instance of the use of different vocabularies. Heschel was very conscious of the threats of modern life, our readiness to exploit, to make the world an instrument for our gratification. Quote, in reducing the world to an instrument, man himself becomes an instrument. We use each other and the environment, and we see the world only in terms of function, only in terms of our use. It is the expedient that is the most important characteristic of the modern temper. Religion, according to Heschel, is a massive no to that modern consciousness, to our lower selves, to our tendency to use a no to self-indulgence, to the gratification culture in which we are so deeply embedded. There must be a, counterpoint, a counterpart to the immense power of man to destroy, which is, of course, the great threat. There must be a voice that says no to man, a voice that is not vague, faint, and inward like qualms of conscience, but equal in spiritual might to man's power to destroy. We need discipline. We need to discipline the lower self. We need the discipline of the mitzvot, which are a leap of action away from self-indulgence and into the mitzvah system. Kaplan would agree with that 100%, that the goal of religion as transcending the individual is certainly very, very much a matter of discipline, a matter of disciplining our power to destroy. Kaplan's favorite verse in the whole Tanakh was not the Shema, it was not love thy neighbor, it was the famous verse from Zechariah, lo b'choach v'lo b'chayel ki im bruchi amar Adonai tzvaot, not by power and not by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. The prophet Zechariah shows us the way, and that is a way that I'm sure Heschel would see as very, very deep for him. But for Kaplan, religion is also a yes. A yes to self-development. A yes to self-realization. A yes to self-actualization. In the 50s, Kaplan actually discovered the works of Abraham Maslow and the humanistic psychologists. And he felt that salvation was equivalent to Maslow's concept of self-actualization. That is something I discovered just recently, and it's not in the book. For Heschel, the self stands for self-indulgence and its evils. The point is that they need to visit each other. They need to understand each other. 
that Heschel needs to understand that not all use is abuse. There is a rational use of our resources in our environment. For Heschel, the word function very often is a bad word. Kaplan called himself a functionalist and wanted to make Judaism function again. When he looks at any element in the tradition, he asks how did it function in its original environment? And that's the meaning of it. Does it still retain that function? If it doesn't retain that function, we have to make it retain that function. We have to reconstruct it. And if we can't, then we have to dismiss it. That was Kaplan's whole approach, and which he called functionalism. He said at one point, what we want is a religion that will help us to gain our bearings in the world, that will keep down the beast in us, and spur us on to worthy endeavors in the field of thought and action. That was his general philosophy of functionalism, and I think that Heschel would agree with that statement 100%. When Kaplan talks of the self in his idea of self-fulfillment, he does not mean egotism or narcissism or just plain selfishness. No one argues for selfishness, except maybe Ayn Rand and her <laughs> friends, but not many others. Kaplan was a rabbi and argued against self-indulgence. There are those who speak of self and speak against the notion of autonomy, against the notion of the sovereign self as being supreme. I would say that they are misconstruing. I would say that they are arguing by oversimplification. Many people argue that way. You take the uh, uh, ideas of your opponent and you oversimplify them. I hope I'm not doing that to Heschel in any way. The self in Kaplan is the full development of the self, the development of all our potential, of all our abilities, our development morally and intellectually. That's what he means by self-development. You have to think of Kohlberg's ethical scale and how you go from a low point of thinking that ethics is about obedience to a high point where you realize it's about general philosophical principles. This idea of Kaplan's has a great philosophical lineage. It has its root, roots in the 19th century concept of Bildung, which begins with Herder and goes to Goethe in the 19th century, which is the harmonious working together of all man's faculties of character. It goes from Goethe to Matthew Arnold and Kaplan read, those of you that are acquainted with my book, I have a whole chapter on Matthew Arnold. Uh, Kaplan got the idea or the concept or the words, uh, God is the power that makes for salvation from Arnold. And it goes from Goethe to Emerson. And those of you who know my work uh, know uh, that I discovered a poem that Kaplan wrote uh, based on an Emerson essay. He was uh, working on the prayer book and he fashioned a essay, a poem on the basis of Heschel, which I'm going to get to in a minute, and Emerson. And I thought, if he's telling me I have to daven from Emerson, daven from Emerson, then I have to read Emerson. And so I got into Emerson, and I spent 15 years knee deep in Emerson, and I couldn't get out. <laughs> Bildung means integration, which is a key concept for Kaplan. On many levels, it means integration on the community level, the political level, of course, and the international level. Kaplan was a very strong supporter of the League, and he also means integration on the cosmic level, the essential unity of being. Speaking on the personal level, we have many selves, and talking about integration, we have many selves. I have a public self, and I have a private self, and I'm not going to tell you about my private self. <laughs> I am a husband, uh, a father, a uh, sometime professor, and a Jew. I have many different selves, 
and I need to integrate all of those selves together. I need to be holy. As the t-shirt says, I need my selves to talk to each other. It's the wholeness. Arnie Eisen was speaking about wholeness. I mean, it's a great philosophical concept. Kaplan, uh, talking about wholeness, uh, referred to the Shema. Well, that will come later. Self-fulfillment also means creativity for Kaplan. On Shabbat, we celebrate creation, the essence of all life, and for Kaplan, that means creativity. Predicate, he is a predicate thinker, and so he very often thought in terms of qualities rather than uh, uh, objects or persons. Not the creator, but creativity, the unique expression of ourselves. When I met him in 1972, Kaplan had the formulation uh, for religion, which was the following. There is enough in the world to meet our needs, but not our greeds for power and pleasure. Needs, but not greeds. Kaplan embraces a religious humanism, which for Heschel might have been an oxymoron. Humanism, of course, means the ideals of compassion, of justice, and of equality, reflecting our higher selves. We must move beyond selfish egotism. Kaplan related his philosophy of needs and greeds to the Shema. Lo taturu acharei l'bavchem v'acharei nechem. Don't be seduced by your heart, which is power, or by your eyes, which is pleasure. This is the essence of what Kaplan was saying. The divine for Kaplan was a way of talking about God, and we must say a word about God, and the relationship between self and God for Kaplan without a long involved explanation. Kaplan used the expression, the idea of God, very often, which I think drove Heschel up the wall. God was not an idea, but that is the same for Kaplan. Kaplan used the expression, the idea of God, or the God idea, but it's perfectly evident in all of Kaplan's writings that there is a reality behind that word, not a personal reality, but a reality, the reality of the unity of all being, the reality of the organicity. He loved that word. The whole universe is like one giant organ with every part related to every other part. And that is what he referred to as the divinity. Kaplan said very clearly that he did not want to reduce the idea of God to ethics. He said that over and over again, and it was very important to him. Kaplan talked frequently of the divine in man, the evidences of God that come from within. Kaplan, in our highest yearnings for truth and beauty and justice, we experience something supranatural. I'm, I know there are some people, particularly William Kaufman, who likes the word and concentrates on the word, and, and Kaplan liked the transnatural. I would like to advocate that because the word transnatural is not very widely used, that we use the word supranatural. Man is not alone, Kaplan says in this quotation, which is written long before Heschel. Man is not alone in his highest strivings, but the universe enables him to reach a truly transcendent realm, though, of course, not a supernatural realm. This is quintessential Kaplan. The divine is embedded within man. 1940, if we can discern in man evidences of a higher order of being, despite their being overlaid with corruption and cruelty, and of course in 1940 one understands that very well, then we can believe in God. The faith in oneself is not merely the faith in one's ability to do things. In other words, we are not talking about mental health, we are talking about what Kaplan called spiritual health. How am I doing? Okay. <laughs> I'm dancing as fast as we can. <laughs> Suzanne and I were concerned about, about time. Okay. One of the things that keeps me going, I get up every day and I read the diary. And 
I, two things keep me going. First of all, I come across books that Kaplan's reading in 1935, 1940, so on and so forth. And I go to my nook, and I find the book, and I download it for nothing, because it's one of the million books that are free of charge, because nobody reads them, and nobody is interested in them. But Kaplan read them, and I download them, and that's a great pleasure to me. So what I am really doing is I'm really following the unfolding of Kaplan's mind, uh, which is, uh, of course, always surprising to me. Um, and the most surprising thing that I recently found is Kaplan on Hindu philosophy. Kaplan was a Buju. <laughs> and I, for one, am proud of it because my wife is also a Buju. No, 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 this is October 1940. Listen to Kaplan. Listen to him. I can very well imagine the ancient Hindu thinkers going through almost the same process of introspection which I described above and which led me to a sense of identity between self and God. This just knocked me off. For how else could they come to regard Brahman, the self-existing creative principle of the world, as identical with Atman, the true self or inner being of man? I mean, that's the basic insight of Hindu philosophy, that the self and the ultimate stuff of the universe are one and the same. And Kaplan says that's what he's saying. I want to end with a few words about piety that draws them together. Piety is to see the eternal in the present moment, the ultimate in the, in the mundane. They were both very pious. Piety is the realm where ultimately they come together in that overlapping area because they were both very, very religious to the core. They both see the fundamental truth of the religious consciousness. Kaplan thinks about God all the time. He is very mindful of the, of the divine. Kaplan, I might say, lives in the realm of the thinkable. Heschel lives in the realm of the ineffable, and I don't think that maybe the realm of the thinkable and the realm of the ineffable are that far from each other in certain instances. Here is Kaplan on piety. And this paragraph, when I, I couldn't believe it because I thought I was reading Heschel rather than reading Kaplan. I have a whole file which is called Kaplan as Heschel. And this is one of my prime uh, instances that's why my chapter on Heschel and Kaplan is called Muttel, which is what his mother called him, Muttel the Pious. <laughs> Listen to Kaplan. Religion is a matter of belonging. Piety is a matter of believing. Religion is prose. Piety is poetry. Religion in God, in religion, is the, what the flower is to the botanist. God and piety is what the flower is to the poet. God in religion is the power that makes for salvation. God in piety is any being from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to any being whose presence was or is experienced with what Otto calls the overwhelming sense of the numinous. I disagree with Bill Kaufman about Otto. Uh, Kaplan felt that Otto was very important, and in The Future of the American Jew, on page 190, he brings Durkheim and Otto together. Kaplan valued that concept of the numinous and felt that Otto was very, very important. Now, when Heschel first arrived in this country, 1940, 1942, he published an essay on piety. Kaplan felt that in order to create new liturgy, you have to take an essay and turn it into a poem so you can pray from it. He did that with Emerson, and he did that with Heschel. That's the way we create new liturgy, and I recommend we have a lot of very smart people in the audience, and a lot of uh, religious, spiritual people, a lot of rabbis. I recommend you try to take your favorite work and turn it into a poem. It's very, very, very difficult. Kaplan wants us to daven from Heschel. Kaplan wants us to daven from Heschel. We need to do that. We need to do that. He put his prayer, 
that he made from the essay in his 1945 prayer book. Heschel is in the prayer book. Heschel is in the prayer book. Everybody that was associated with that prayer book was excommunicated. Everybody, everybody, which means that Heschel was excommunicated along with Kaplan. <laughs> Heschel was one with Kaplan. Kaplan, Kaplan, the, the um, essay, the um, poem is called What is Piety? What is Piety? And it's in the back of the 1945 prayer book. And if you go to the end, he lists the author of this poem, not as Mordechai Kaplan, but as Heschel. <laughs> Just absolute, bowls me over. The pious man, what is piety? Now, the point is that the language is Heschel and the poem is Kaplan. What is piety? Is it the abandonment of the world? Is it scrupulous performance of rites or fanatic zeal? Let us observe the pious man and probe into his soul. We that sh shall discover in it that which transcends man, that which surmounts the visible and the available, steadily preventing him from immersing himself in sensation or ambition, from yielding to passion or slaving for a career. For him, life takes place among the span uh, beyond the years. He senses the significance in small things. He is alive to the sublime in common acts and in simple thoughts. And, and Kaplan took that essay, which contains this language, and gave it to his rabbinical students at the seminary. And he said, this is the way to reconstruct Judaism, traditional Judaism. So one might say that Heschel, he wanted Heschel to be part of his program of reconstruction. Kaplan is not merely the naturalist, which is what I'm saying. He goes beyond that. He goes beyond to supranaturalism. He feels the pull of the powers in the universe and the way they help our minds and our hearts towards self-fulfillment. He is religious to the core. He wants to relate. He wants to be thankful and to help others to be thankful. It is almost as if he wants the relationship to God, but without the supernaturalism. It is not naturalism. It is supranaturalism. Naturalism pushed to the ultimate going beyond the natural. He is powerfully pulled to where he began with his father. We see this in a discussion of Shemini Atzeret in the meaning of God in modern Jewish religion, where he presents God as presence and beatitude. Those are Kaplan's words, presence and beatitude. This is the place where Kaplan and Heschel come together in a single quest for the transcendent and for the transformation of each one of us. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. I've just received an interesting email from a prominent Orthodox rabbi in Chicago who's watching us on the web, and so I'm challenging him for the web. If he wants to put it in the form of a question, I'll be delighted to relay it. Uh, that's my way of saying it, just a reminder that please do send in questions. Uh, email dan at kaplancenter.org, Twitter, uh, hashtag Kaplan Conference, all one word. Uh, again, my cell phone number, particularly for those who have it already in their directories, is 847-404-3122 for uh, text messaging. Um, and it's, <laughs> it's working so far. And of course, the old-fashioned way, uh, note cards, which we'll pass around again. So it's a pleasure now to welcome uh, Dr. Susanna Heschel. And I just want to say, in addition to what's in the biography, um, we're particularly appreciative of the fact that Dr. Heschel was one of the very first of now, I'm proud to say, a wonderfully transdenominational group of uh, rabbi scholars and others uh, who signed on as a supporter of the Kaplan Center at its very inception. So thank you for that. Thank you, Dan Cederbaum, for all that you do, and especially for this conference and for inviting me to take part. And I thank also Professor Jacques Berlinerblau, and most of all, Mel Skult. Mel is fantastic. <laughs> that was a great talk, and it's always wonderful to hear you and to be with you, and I am so grateful to you for having asked me to join you in this. Thank you. Um, 
I, I want to mention a few things. There's so many things, aspects that, that Mel raised and that there are to be said about my father and Dr. Kaplan, as he always referred to him, Dr. Kaplan. They had a personal relationship, a friendship. They socialized as couples, even before I was born and after I was born. My father wanted me very much to meet and to know Dr. Kaplan, and I remember vividly my father taking me to the Kaplan's home to meet him, to be with him, even when I was a young girl. They had a friendship. They had also a loyalty to one another, despite differences that they also had. And I think that loyalty, the respect that they showed to each other, is a model of behavior that we should take seriously. Kaplan, Dr. Kaplan, as Mel said already, is one of the first who read my father's work at the seminary, the essay on piety, and who worked also to help bring my father to join the faculty of the Jewish Theological Seminary, and that's important. There wasn't much that they had in common and really a true friendship. Now, I want to also say the important role that Dr. Kaplan played in our family life. That is, I was born somehow, I don't know how it happened, but I was born a feminist. I was fortunate that my parents accepted my feminism and agreed with me and supported me all the time. So that when I was um, 11 or 12 and I said, I want a bat mitzvah, and I want it on a Shabbat morning in the synagogue, my parents said, fine. Now, the synagogue we went to was the Jewish Theological Seminary where men and women sat separately. My father invited the chancellor, Dr. Louis Finkelstein, to our home for tea one Shabbat afternoon, and I liked Dr. Finkelstein very much. And my parents let me do the talking. So Dr. Finkelstein sat down, and I said to him, what do you think of the civil rights movement? And Dr. Finkelstein was very proud to talk about his relationship with Martin Luther King and his support for civil rights and uh, inviting Dr. King to speak at the seminary and so forth. And then I said, that's good. Now, what do you think about equality for women? I want a bat mitzvah. <laughs> at which point, his face changed. He smiled nicely. He said, I'll make a party at my home and we'll have cookies. That wasn't what I had in mind. And my father went to Anshe Chesed and organized everything so that uh, I would have a bat mitzvah on Shabbat morning. And of course, the Kaplans were invited. And Dr. Kaplan sent a letter to my father that I want to read to you. On behalf, it is dear Professor Heschel, on behalf of Mrs. Kaplan and myself, I congratulate you on the occasion of your daughter, Hannah Susanna's bat mitzvah. May she grow up to be a good Jewess. <laughs> and a source of happiness and blessing to both of you and to all whom she will meet on life's way. As you probably know, Dr. Heschel, I inaugurated the Bat Mitzvah celebration with my oldest daughter, Judith, in 1922. She was the first of the four reasons for my doing that, the other three also being girls. <laughs> I am indeed happy that you approve of what I did, even though it apparently involved going out of your way. With all good wishes, Mordechai Kaplan. It was a lovely note. And then when I was 16, I wanted to mark my special birthday with an aliyah. And the only place where I could have an aliyah in those days in New York City was at SAJ. So my father arranged that as well. It was a long walk that Shabbat morning. So I have much to be grateful to Dr. Kaplan for his First step for his way of thinking, I appreciate it very much. And in so many other ways, too, and I say this quite seriously, Dr. Kaplan paved the way for my father. He was a generation older, that's true. But he paved the way in lots of ways by defying the assimilation of American Jews with his Zionism, with calling attention to ethnicity and the importance of the synagogue and of Jewish observance for immersing oneself in all things Jewish. Pride in showing that Judaism is dynamic and alive and changing with us. Dr. Kaplan was a model of courage in the face of both assimilation and obscurantism. And in fact, in this respect, I would say there are a few things that are very important that my father shared with Dr. Kaplan. They hated and these are a few things that unfortunately mark a great deal of Jewish life. They hate shallow, shallowness. They hated literal-mindedness and literal-minded readings of the Bible. 
of the Talmud, of what Heinrich Gretz once called Bornierter Shulchan Ruchanismus, this kind of petty details about the Shulchan Aruch. I went to a lecture recently where somebody was talking, when you visit a sick person, do you do so out of chesed or because it's a chiyav, it's an obligation to visit a sick person? And they were debating. He said, you know, chesed, you know, mercy, love, is not just a Christian thing. He had to explain to the just Jewish audience. And they were saying, no, 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 you have to visit only because it's an obligation. And if you don't visit a sick person because it's an obligation, then it went on like this. And I thought, such pettiness, such small-mindedness. My father once asked his students at the seminary, is gelatin kosher? And they had a nice, lively debate. Is you make the gelatin in the laboratory out of chemicals, maybe then it's kosher, maybe it isn't. And then he stopped them and he said, gentlemen, are nuclear weapons kosher? And they were quiet. They didn't know where to begin because they weren't thinking in those terms. And I think Dr. Kaplan, as well as my father, hated that kind of shallowness, small-mindedness, and laziness that make us focus on the wrong kinds of questions, not the big questions, not the deep questions. Now, of course, they had much in common. They came from Orthodox backgrounds. They came from Europe. They had smicha in Europe. And they were not afraid to be innovative. And in fact, just as Dr. Kaplan, as you all well know already, was very innovative in religious life, Jews, and of general community life, in addition to that, my father, too, was innovative, even though he was orthodox. And by the way, if my father wanted to really daven on Shabbat, he went to the Ger Shtibel on the Upper West Side, Rabbi Tziviak. I don't think he would have gone, by the way, to Bachon Hadar, no matter what that boy says. Yes. Um, my father, who worked extensively on the Kotzka Rebbe, also pointed out, based on the Kotzka, that Judaism has to be authentic to who we are. In order for Judaism to be authentic to who we are, we have to know who we are. Who are we? We have to explore ourselves. And in that sense, I would also say, it's not about transcending the self, but rather going more deeply into oneself and cultivating what we have in us, our sensibilities. Cultivating sensibilities also takes education. My father was never without a book. He was aggressively intellectual, always reading and studying. Because how can you understand, for example, the music of Mozart unless you know something about music? You, sh you deepen your understanding, and so too Jewishly. And there too, I'm sure Dr. Kaplan agreed without question. My father actually says in Man is Not Alone in one place, to be Jewish the way our grandparents were Jewish, that would be spiritual plagiarism. So innovation was something they also shared. Dr. Kaplan's prayer books, yes, as you say, included my father and that poem. And that's very striking, because my father was not included in the Rabbinical Assembly's Shabbat prayer book that came out in the early 1970s. Both were isolated, as we know, at the seminary. My father knew that Dr. Kaplan suffered at JTS. Dr. Kaplan knew that my father was treated badly at the seminary. Both wanted to leave. Where could they go? But in a way, I would say perhaps it's a good thing in this sense, because they were able to transcend the institution and both become rabbis to the entire Jewish community, and I would say, in fact, to the world. These are two people whose work is far more than being professors at the seminary. They transcended it. And I think in that sense, too, another similarity would be they both asked themselves, what does the world need from me now? My father certainly asked himself that. He was indeed, as Mel said, expected to become a Hasidic Rebbe. All of his ancestors were. And you know, it's an inherited position. My father came from truly great Yichas. And in fact, I'm proud to tell you that you know what's a goodest Yisrael. You know who's the head of a goodest Yisrael today? The Novominska Rebbe. You know, he, his grandfather and my grandmother were twins in Warsaw. Yeah, but my father was descended from great Rebbes, and that was what was expected of him. But he asked himself, and he spoke about this, what does the world need from me now? And he felt he needed to explain something to the world about what it is to be a Jew. 
That's what he wanted. And Rabbi Belkin once said to him, you're rabbi to the world. Now, I would say for points of difference, Dr. Kaplan was very much in step with his era. And as Mel said, it's a generation earlier than my father. He was in step. He understood so well what American Jews needed, intellectually, organizationally. He was able to translate his ideas inst into institutions, and that was very important, and in a long-lasting way. Not that many thinkers are still read 100 years later. That's great. My father, by contrast, was out of step. I'm not sure if he really knew so much about American Jews. I think my mother helped him understand America. I grew up, I can tell you, always feeling like a tourist in America. We lived in a kind of enclave. My parents' friends were European Jewish refugee scholars. And we talked about Europe at the table. I knew the names of all the German philosophers when I was a little girl and the great literature and poetry and Jewish thinkers. The name of Abraham Geiger was known to me as a little girl, and I wrote about him for my first book. My father was in many ways out of step. He was criticized, misunderstood, even reviled. And keep in mind that in those days, he were, here were two great thinkers writing Jewish theology at a time when people said, there is no such thing as Jewish theology, which is, of course, utter nonsense. My father never said he was a conservative Jew. He never identified with a particular movement. He was beyond those movements. And I think in many ways, too, that although Mordechai Kaplan is represented by the Reconstructionist movement, he's someone with something to say to all Jews in all circumstances. Whether they know it or not, they should be reading him. My father respected and appreciated Dr. Kaplan he felt he kept Jews Jewish. He appreciated his Zionism. And he realized that with Dr. Kaplan, that both of them wanted a revival of Jewish spirit and Jewish commitment. For instance, and here's something that I think Dr. Kaplan would have agreed with wholeheartedly. In 1958, my father wrote that being in Galut, in exile, means not only being outside the land of Israel, it's also a spiritual condition. And he said, some bar mitzvah affairs are galut. <laughs> Don't we know it? And my daughter's 13, and she's going every week to her classmates, and I know what's going on. Our timidity and hesitance to take a stance on behalf of the Negroes are galut. It is not only that we are in galut, galut is in us. Wouldn't Dr. Kaplan agree with that? But now, let's talk about some other things. Dr. Kaplan spoke about Jewish civilization. My father, toward the end of his book, God in Search of Man, also speaks about civilization. But he speaks about transcending civilization. He says in this section, the art of surpassing civilization, section is called. And I'll just read you a couple of sentences. To be a Jew is to affirm the world without being enslaved to it, to be a part of civilization and to go beyond it, to conquer space and to sanctify time. Judaism is the art of surpassing civilization, sanctifying time, sanctifying history. Civilization is on trial. Some have taken this as a critique of Dr. Kaplan. I would say it's a play on Dr. Kaplan, perhaps. And of course, it was written after World War II in a different era. And I also would wonder if Dr. Kaplan wouldn't have agreed with a statement like that. I would say that Dr. Kaplan begins to take us to a certain point, and my father picks up in the next generation and takes us to the next step. And had Dr. Kaplan been of the same generation, my father might have lost that preparedness, that way that Dr. Kaplan prepared for us. On the other hand, Dr. Kaplan might have been a comrade with my father in speaking in similar terms. My father understood God very differently, I think. I don't think he would have taken the kind of approach 
that Dr. Kaplan took even a generation earlier. I don't think Dr. Kaplan would have agreed with my father that there is a tzorach gavoha, a divine need, that God needs us, that God responds to us. There are very personal ways that my father speaks of God, anthropomorphic ways, one might say. And at the same time, I'll just tell you, there was a wonderful little teaching from one of my father's ancestors, the Abderav, that I think puts it very well. The Abderav, also known as the Oyev Yisrael, Abraham Joshua Heschel of Abt, who died in 1825, the Abderav says, we human beings speak of God in human terms. We speak of the arm of God, the finger of God. We anthropomorphize. And then he says, but how does it look from the other side? How does God see us? In other words, are we imaged by God in divine terms? You know, we can't even begin to spell that out because immediately we would begin to anthropomorphize if we try to do that. But there is a decentering that my father has that reminds us always, we may speak of God, but remember, God also has to have faith in us and think of us and respond to us. And we should keep in mind at least the difficulty that we have even in beginning to think of what it means from God's point of view to think about human beings. There, I think, is an important distinction between my father and Dr. Kaplan. And I would say that this brings us to a, an argument made by Charles Taylor, the philosopher, in his book called Secular Age, a big, thick book that came out a few years ago, where he distinguishes between the porous self and the buffered self. He says that in the pre-modern era, we have a sense of being porous. That is, we are penetrated. God can come into our lives and into our hearts. We are affected, some people think, by spirits for example. Whereas in the modern period, we have a sense of being buffered. There's a buffer around us. If we have a problem, we resolve it in our minds. We deal with it. You know, some contemporary social scientists have talked about human beings today as being entrepreneurial selves. Everyone wants to be an entrepreneur or an investment banker among my students. <laughs> that is, Everyone wants to make the self fit and healthy and uh, successful. And one is employed, in a sense, by oneself. You are an employer of yourself to make yourself a good entrepreneur in this world, a success. And at a certain point, we begin to wonder, where is the joy, the pleasure, but also, yes, indeed, the sense of being porous, of being affected by other human beings? and certainly by God. What does it mean to be a religious person in an age of the entrepreneur as the pinnacle? So for my father, the issue is, how do we develop the sensibilities to perceive that indeed we are objects of divine concern? That's the central question. And that's how he opens, God in search of man, man is not alone. What qualities in ourselves can we cultivate to perceive God's presence and know that we are an object of divine concern. Let me conclude with a few final points. The philosopher Richard Rorty, who Mel cited a few minutes ago, makes a distinction between systematic theology and edifying philosophy. Systematic philosophy tries to answer the questions that are already on the table proposed and discussed and debated by prior philosophers. Edifying philosophers, by contrast, attempt to create a sense of wonder, a sense that there's something new, a new question, at least the possibility of a new way of thinking. And that's where I think theology should be, in edifying philosophy and edifying us, in giving us a sense of wonder. And that's certainly something that my father strove to achieve. Modernity, yes, but it's not enough. I think both Dr. Kaplan and my father did respect the great innovations brought by modern thought in philosophy, in historiography, even in the social sciences, although my father was far more skeptical of the social sciences than Dr. Kaplan. But nonetheless, it's not enough. 
And I'll just tell you one anecdote. My father was studying in Berlin from 1927 at the University of Berlin and also at the Hochschule, at the Reform Rabbinical School and at the Orthodox Rabbinical School, which are located on the same street in Berlin, not far from the university. Nobody went back and forth. You either went to one or you went to the other. You didn't go to both. And in fact, the two were located in a street that used to be called Artillery Street. <laughs> My father went into his Bible class. He wanted to study critical um, Wissenschaft methods of studying Bible. And the professor came into the class, Professor Torchiner, later known as Torsina, you may know his name. And they were studying Isaiah. And it came to the, the verse that says, Nachamu, Nachamu, Ami, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. And the professor said, why does it say it twice? It must be a scribal error. Maybe the scribe was copying down the text and was momentarily distracted and went back and forgot he had written Nachamu once, so he wrote it a second time. So we cross it out to amend the text and get back to the original pristine text with no sense of poetry. Historical critical method is useful, but it also has its limitations. Modernity is good, but it's not enough. Indeed, the issue was not so much to transcend the self, but to deepen the self to deepen one's authenticity, and therefore make Judaism authentic to who we are, to overcome the limitations that block us, that block us, that keep us from praying in a meaningful way, for example. Finally, Mel pointed out a distinction between religion and piety. So let me conclude by saying that there my father also shared with Dr. Kaplan something very important. He talked about theology versus depth theology, and I think that's parallel in what he intended to theology and piety. Theology, he said, is like sculpture. Depth theology is like music. It's the inspiration, the religiosity. And he turned that distinction into something very important in his interfaith work as well. And since we're here at Georgetown, I just want to say that for my father, what was important when we gather, either as Jews and Christians, or perhaps as secular Jews and religious Jews, or Reconstructionists and Orthodox, or whatever we happen to be, is not necessarily to talk about the differences we have. Let's say the Jews and Christians talking about Christology. We're not going to agree. But let's talk instead about what brings us together, what binds us, and also what we can do together jointly, and how we can help one another. For Jews and Christians, the issue may be, how do we support one another in moments of despair? How do we help each other if we have difficulty praying? How do we deal with theological dilemmas that arise for both of us? And I know that my father admired and respected Dr. Kaplan. He may have differed with him, but he certainly never criticized him. He respected him and he admired him and I think he was grateful for the ways that Dr. Kaplan paved the way. And in so many ways too, he and Dr. Kaplan share something very important and very profound in modeling for us how we might speak across differences on the level of piety of depth theology. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful presentations. Questions that are coming up. For Dr. Skult, if there is organicity in the universe as the um, as, or as a principle, why is there so much chaos? Why is pathology built into each of us, emerging at different times in our uh, real organs? Well, simple question. <laughs> yes, yeah, simple question. Um, I can't explain the universe. I just, I just want to say that uh, Kaplan um, was very conscious of the chaos, and he talked about. God as um, 
the forces in the universe uh, that bring order out of chaos. He said that many, many times. So um, we uh, become victims of the chaos. And um, Kaplan believed that we are capable. He was a pragmatist. Uh, and he uh, believed he, he did not have a, a problem of theodicy. Because um, God is not a self, uh, because God is a process, uh, and we are sometimes victim of that process, we do not have to ask about will. We do not have to ask why God does this to us. Uh, what we need to do is we need to cope. Uh, so what we need to do when we are victims of the forces of the universe, uh, and it is very often accidental, uh, we are victims of this snowstorm. Uh, not yet. But, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> but the point is that the snowstorm is not necessarily chaos. And so what we have to do is we have to have an early warning system, uh, and we have to have a way to clean up the streets, and we have to put up, he said, a lightning rod uh, when there is lightning, and push back uh, the forces that assault us. And uh, that was his pragmatic attitude uh, towards chaos when, when, you, when we are afflicted. One more for, uh, for Dr. Skuld. Apropos of your opening remarks, might Kaplan's not-so-random thoughts have been a late career attempt to find pithier prose in emulation of Dr. Heschel? <laughs> well, um, I don't know if you know what uh, this person is referring to. There is a book called Not So Random Thoughts, which has pithy individual sayings by Kaplan, which are wonderful. I would say some of them are Herschelian and some of them are not, but they are wonderful. Uh, the expression uh, uh, tradition has a vote but not a veto is from that collection. Um, in the Reconstructionist for many, many years, um, Kaplan had a column which he defined, which he entitled, uh, Random Thoughts. And he put one-liners. And uh, my intelligence on this matter comes from Manny Goldsmith. And Manny Goldsmith, being with Kaplan at that point, when he edited that book, Kaplan didn't know what to call it. And uh, you can't call it Random Thoughts, because that's what was in the Reconstructionist. So Manny suggested the idea of not so random thoughts. <laughs> and that comes from Manny. But I recommend it very, very highly. I want to say, by the way, um, that in addition to the diary, I always talk about the diary because it's really um, uh, the most wonderful, wonderful uh, collection. The point is that you don't, um, Kaplan didn't fix up the diary. Uh, and uh, so it's so readable and it's so accessible because it has the immediacy of, of, of lived experience. Um, uh, but if one wants to talk about Kaplan books, um, there is a, uh, a book called Questions Jews Ask. And uh, Dan Cederbaum is not the first person who advocated that you have uh, cards passed out, <laughs> uh, because that's what Kaplan did at many of his lectures. And uh, the questions were handed in, and Kaplan kept those cards and uh, eventually uh, uh, divided them up into subjects and answered them. And it's one of Kaplan's best books, uh, uh, Questions Jews Ask. I, I recommend it very, very, very highly. OK, this, I think, is primarily for Dr. Heschel, although Mel, you can weigh in, too. One of Kaplan's notable ideas was his rejection of the traditional chosen people concept. How did uh, Dr. Heschel respond to Kaplan's rejection of that concept, if you know? Yes, indeed. It, it comes at the end, actually, of God in Search of Man. My father actually discusses chosenness directly um, and speaks of, um, he says, and this is really the last page of the book. Israel's experience of God has not evolved from search. Israel did not discover God. Israel was discovered by God. We have not chosen God. He has chosen us. There is no concept of a chosen God, but there is the idea of a chosen people. 
But this does not suggest the preference for a people based upon a discrimination among a number of peoples. We do not say that we are a superior people. The chosen people means a people approached and chosen by God. The significance of this term is genuine in relation to God rather than in relation to other peoples. It signifies not a quality inherent in the people, but a relationship between the people and God. Did you want to comment, Bill? Yeah. Um, I mean, let's call a spade a spade. There's no doubt that Kaplan felt the Jewish people were special. I mean, he did. He was a very, very, very deeply dedicated Jew. And so that, that attachment to the Jewish people, Manny talked about this, that attachment to the Jewish people was more basic to his personality than anything else. Um, on the one hand. On the other hand, when one talks about chosenness as not meaning superiority, um, you know, it's sort of embedded. Um, and so he actually dismissed the matter of chosenness very early in his career. Uh, in the 1920s, he changed the prayer book. I want to say a word, by the way, about uh, Heschel and the prayer book, because there's the Nakis Oxo of Heschelian line that um, what happened is that Heschel came to New York in, I'll come back to chosenness, Heschel came to New York in 1943 uh, and met Kaplan. And Kaplan was working on the prayer book. And obviously, Kaplan told him about the changes that he was making, and Heschel was very upset. So Heschel goes back to Cincinnati, and he writes Kaplan a letter, which I discovered years and years ago, which has a wonderful, fantastic line. And the line is that, that prayer is not a matter of nusach. It's not a matter of the language of prayer. It's a matter of kavanah. What we need is a community of kavanah, which is wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And, yes. And let me just add to that, if I may. In, in 1936, my father was invited by Martin Buber to come to Heppenheim. My father was living in Berlin at the time uh, for tea. And he described the tea. And uh, at this gathering, they were talking about adult Jewish education, the Jüdisches Lehrhaus. And my father describes that the debate went like this. Buber was saying, we have to teach these adults the words of the prayers. And my father said, no, we have to teach them how to pray. Wow. So it has a similar echo. Yeah, and, and what I was saying, in a certain sense, is that, the, is that when Kaplan says we should pray from Heschel, that is a community of Kavanaugh. Yeah. That itself. I, I, I feel very, very strongly about it. I guess I need to ask you a question. Is it true, we got to give you some juicy gossip. Um, is it true that Martin Buber, to your knowledge, was responsible for Heschel's book on Maimonides not being accepted by Shokin? I mean, there's a book no, that I just- No, not on Maimonides, it's the prophets, the dissertation. Oh, the prophets, yeah. Oh, the prophets, yes. Is, is, that, is that true? You know, my father didn't like to talk about bad things, so oh. I will follow his example. <laughs> I but, mean, Buber and, and but Heschel this, got- the, the situation my father finished his dissertation in December of 1932. In right. order to get the degree, you had to publish a dissertation. Right. And who was going to publish a book by a Jew about the prophets in Germany at that time? So it took almost three years and finally was published in Poland. And he had to get permission from right. Berlin when the university right. accepted, et cetera. Right. Maimonides' book was something else. It was Eric oh, Rice no, no. offered him a contract to write a book, which prophets. he wrote in three weeks prophets. on Maimonides. Yeah. But this was the prophets. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But you can ask the question, why wasn't it published by Schocken in, in Germany okay, why since wasn't they it? had a flourish? That's a question. That's, That's a, a good qu question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a question. Okay. That's a question. Let me quickly mention okay. co uh, coffee I, 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 before yeah. you go. Uh, coffee is refreshed. Cookies either are out or about to be out. And I'm pleased to announce, thank you to Georgetown, we're donating all of the uh, extra food to a homeless shelter. So that's great. I'm sorry. Can, can we go on? Go on. More questions. Yeah. Oh, I, I want to say another word about chosenness. <laughs> More questions. I want to say a couple of words about chosenness. Last word on chosenness. Last word on chosenness. Uh, two words. Um, one is that Kaplan had the idea of vocation, which he uses in um, Judaism as a civilization. And of course, the idea of vocation, the idea of a calling, is something that is very, very familiar to us. Some people say that he was getting chosen this in the back door. Because it, but it, what's significant is that everybody can have a calling. And what was so moving to me is I recently discovered 
uh, in reading the diary that Kaplan was influenced by Jung, Carl Gustav Jung. And in a book called The Development of Personality, Jung talks about the calling of the individual. That is to say, what is unique to that individual? What is, what, what is, where does he feel moved and so on and I so forth? I appreciate that, but nonetheless, Bukhar was removed. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Can I quote you Max Kedushin? What? Oh, okay. I interviewed Max Kedushin, a great rabbinic scholar about um, um, Kaplan, and he said to me something very, very interesting. He said the, the, the key rabbinic concepts are all nouns, you know, Torah and Tshuva and so on and so forth. And he said the, the idea of chosenness is not a noun. The is not, an, is not a, 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 a fundamental rabbinic concept. It's Asher Bochar Banu. And, well, and Kedushin said to me, it's not fundamental. Okay. But what I, we're going to move on. Okay. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay, I, let Daniel. Go okay. ahead. We're going to turn that one over to a Hebrew grammarian. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. That's a good point. This is primarily for Dr. Heschel. Is not Kaplan's influence on Heschel especially evident at the conclusion of Heschel's The Prophets, where he writes, and this is, uh, uh, I think, a, a hope a quotation, that God is a personal being only to the extent that he is concerned with that which exists beyond himself? Mm -hmm. You know, I would want to look at the passage yeah, in, in the larger prophets. context, but uh, it, it sounds to me, reminds me a bit of a passage that my father quoted from the Midrash frequently, which is, um, God says, I am God and you are my witnesses, and if you are not my witnesses, then I am not God. So there is, a, let's say, a dependence or a need. Yeah, that's Great. Um, we have an interesting question on Spinoza and Kaplan, but because we will have a wonderful paper on Spinoza and Kaplan <laughs> later in the program, we're going to defer uh, that one. Thank you. Um, we've had a, a challenge uh, from a, a questioner, a general challenge, uh, to turn to the future. We've talked a lot about the past. So would either of you care to say a few words about the relevance of the tensions and the agreements, points of agreement between Kaplan and Heschel for the future of non-Orthodox Judaism in North America, particularly perhaps in Israel as well. I, I, I just feel that what we are experiencing at the present moment is the individualization of religion. In other words, so many people, the concern with spirituality, I don't think it's a bad word, uh, overused, yes, and, and it becomes trite, but the point is, it is a concern with the individual. And, I mean, Kaplan and Heschel both loved Am Yisrael, but at the same time, they understood that it was the transfa transformation of the individual that was important. And that's why everybody loves Heschel, because he understood that, and you said that so strongly. And I feel that Kaplan is on the same playing field in, in dealing with that whole issue. And people talk about Judaism as a civilization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and don't really understand the sense in which Kaplan was concerned with the full development, what I called Bildung, the full development of the self, which is very much what you were saying in terms of getting deeper into the self. Kaplan didn't put it that way, but obviously that's what he meant. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I, I, one of the th legacies of Dr. Kaplan that's so important is the intellectual dynamism in Reconstructionist uh, synagogues. I find Reconstructionist congregations the most interesting, the most best informed, and, and the widely read people. I would say that we all face, in addition to what you've said, and I agree with you, um, we also face a vulgarization of the synagogue, uh, and that concerns me. And a vulgarization, I would say, of both of these thinkers of Dr. Kaplan and my father. Uh, I'll give you an example. I was at a synagogue and the rabbi said, well, Abraham Heschel came back from Selma and he said, I felt that my legs were praying and now the next aliyah goes to members of our bicycle club. <laughs> yeah, so there is a, there's a vulgarity. I was at a synagogue recently in Florida and there were people on the bima chewing gum. I was horrifying. And there's a deadening, I find, even in the Orthodox synagogue that I go to. I'm not sure they really have kavanah. Yes, they're observant, but yeah, we need both of them. Another quotation from Dr. Heschel. 
We cannot make God present to us, but we can make ourselves present to God. Would this be a point of um, agreement between uh, Heschel and Kaplan, Mel, I suppose, first? I I, I guess I need to say something. I guess I need to say something about um, a fundamental uh, area of disagreement. This matter, you alluded to it, um, God in search of man. Uh, God is very, very much um, a person. Uh, God is, or not a person, God is a self in Heschel and in, in, in the tradition. God is a self, God feels, God is concerned and, and, and uh, that's fundamentally important. Um, in Kaplan's thinking, God is not a self, God is a process and a series of processes. God is an aspect of the universe. I really don't like the um, Uh, the words God as the power that makes for salvation because I feel that is a reification Um, and that's not really what Kaplan could you think God is not a power but he's a process and he's up there somewhere Um, what I would like to say is that God uh, that that the the universe favors the development of personality the universe favors the development of of consciousness and of uh, uh, the consciousness and of ideals, the universe favors us. Um, Oliver Wendell Holmes, which is one of those people that Kaplan mentions, and I went back to my nook and started to read Oliver Wendell Holmes, says that the world, the universe has a mind because it has us. Okay, so what I'd like to what I'd like to say is that in a naturalistic way, Kaplan has the sense. Of, of, of the divinity of personality. In other words, God is not a person, but the personality itself is, is a divine aspect. And I just happen to have here a quotation from Kaplan, which illustrates this point that I've been trying to make. He says, in man, man and woman, okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> in man, selfhood, soul, or personality are the terms by which we designate the principle of integration. Integration. And that is the manifestation of the divine in man. His salvation thus consists in his maximum possible integration. So the concept of integration, which I was talking about before, which exists on so many different levels, is is an aspect of self, but it is also an aspect of the universe. And so that's where, um, you know, he comes down. For uh, Dr. Skald, do you know if uh, Kaplan had much to say about Islam or had much contact with uh, Muslims, leaders, or others? Not that I have found, no. He, he was very um, uh, together. I mean, one talks about Heschel and his ecumenicity, and, and I think that's something that uh, Heschel and Kaplan share. With Kaplan, it was a matter of Christian leaders, uh, John Haynes Holmes, there are other people uh, uh, that he was very, very close to. The other thing that I want to say, which I've discovered in the last kind of year and a half, um, it leads up to uh, and culminates in what Manny has been doing um, for many years with Henry Nelson Wyman. Uh, what I find is that I keep on coming across books written by uh, Christian theologians that influence um, Kaplan. Uh, it starts with a man by the name of Baum at the late 19th century, and it culminates in a man by the name of uh, Hawking, William Ernest Hawking, and, and Albert Knudsen. And then what I found is there was a book by Albert Knudsen called The Philosophy of Personalism. And Kaplan gave that to his students at the seminary to read. In other words, the idea that the person was at the center of the religious quest. And that obviously makes sense in Christianity because of Jesus, but it doesn't necessarily figure in Judaism. So it was Christianity. He did not relate to Muslims. Do you want to add something, or should we move on? Go move on. It's okay. So uh, the next question correctly begins. I know that this question calls for much speculation, but here it is. Had Kaplan and Heschel been women rather than men, 
and experience life and social reality as women rather than men. How do you think that would have influenced their thoughts and writings? So we have to begin with Dr. Hess. I you know, uh, yeah, right. I, I, We're going to be quiet. I'm now. You're gonna be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm disqualified. Okay. Yeah, this is this is. Uh, it, it should be quite clear and obvious. If they had all all of the modern Jewish thinkers had been women, we wouldn't have modern Jewish thought because they would not have had the experience. For example, that story about Franz Rosenzweig going to a little shtiebel in Berlin, right? And then he decides not to convert to Christianity. Well, what if he had been a woman and he'd gone upstairs <laughs> behind the curtain? You think he would have he said, oh, this is for me? No, I don't think so. So, um, and it goes on from there. So what, would my father, as a woman, my father had four sisters. Were they told they could become a Hasidic Rebbe one day? Of course not. Yeah, and would he have been accepted as a student? Well, maybe he could have gone to the University of Berlin and the Hochschule, but certainly not the Orthodox Rabbinical School, where no women on the faculty of the Jewish Theological Seminary. Uh, of all of my parents' friends, you know, there were one or two very marginal people, a woman who was a musicologist, for example, but women were not professionals, and certainly I was never told. In fact, people were quite, my parents were very liberal and encouraging and saying you should get a master's degree. My mother would say, so you'll have something to fall back on in case something happens to your husband, that kind of thing. So, you know, scholarship was very much of a male thing, and certainly the synagogue experience was male. So, no, we would have no modern Jewish thought at all. But if to think of it this way, what great insights and fantastic theology have we lost as a result? Don't say it. Don't say anything. Don't talk. <laughs> Next question. I don't know if it's fair, uh, I'm editorializing here, to ask you to do this very succinctly, but if you feel you can. And the question basically asks, how did each of Kaplan and Heschel account for the Shoah, the Holocaust, particularly for the apparent absence of God during that period? Mel, do you want to start? OK. Uh, I am very, very disturbed by a factor which I don't completely understand, which is Kaplan on the Shoah. He did not write on the Shoah. Um, but I've been reading the diary um, in the 1930s and 1940s. And uh, it's filled with his sense of pain. It's filled with his sense of outrage at uh, uh, what was happening to the Jewish people and, and the, the sense of threat. Um, I have a, 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 a kind of an explanation, but it seems to be um, uh, not completely uh, satisfying. Because what Kaplan was thinking about, he was not thinking about the horror because it, this is in the 30s and 40s. He was not thinking about the horror because it, it wasn't apparent. What he was thinking about was the ways in which to, to, to counter, the ways to cope with the threat of, of, of this uh, 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 exaggerated national chauvinism, fascism. And he wanted, it was important to him to distinguish this from uh, his own idea, from his Zionism. And so he said the only way to cope with it was um, through democracy. And so he advocated a very strong uh, uh, strength in league and so on and so forth. And that was the, the nature of his response, which is not the nature of our response. Um, he, he doesn't believe in a God that inflicts suffering, and so he doesn't have a problem with the Odyssey. It's a big question and it deserves a lot of attention. So just very briefly, uh, I think in almost everything my father writes, there is some mention of Auschwitz and Hiroshima. And it's always the two that he puts together, which is interesting. It's not only in his writings, in, in his book on Israel, but all throughout, uh, but also in his social activism, as one calls it. That is why he became involved in civil rights and why in the Nostra Aetate, in the Second Vatican Council, and ecumenical work more generally, in the movement to free Soviet Jews, et cetera, et cetera. It's all informed by that. I would just add to it, though, that he also makes a very powerful statement about how it's necessary for us to say Kaddish not only for the six million, but for our own souls, for what we've lost. Next questioner writes, having the spirit of Heschel so powerfully in the room and knowing Kaplan felt strongly about the important place of social justice in Judaism, I'm compelled to ask, did Kaplan write directly about civil rights issues, particularly those that Heschel famously championed? No? You wanna... Kaplan wrote very, very often about social issues, and Eric um, 
Kaplan, who is here uh, can, and uh, is going to speak to this, there's going to be a whole panel on it, and so I hesitate to say anything. Um, but the point is that in the years that I've been reading lately, in the late 30s and 40s, um, uh, his concerns were very, very strong and were always there. He was very concerned with uh, a unionism and the support of unionism. Um, uh, there was an incident in Jersey City and the mayor um, uh, uh, tried to, to sabotage the unions and Kaplan came out um, uh, against the mayor. And it, what's most interesting to me in, in the diary, what happens is that one of his congregants says to him, you know, you really ought to stay in the pulpit and not speak out um, against, uh, uh, not speak out on these social issues. And that's why I, I have an, an enormous amount of uh, respect for people like Elliot uh, Tepperman uh, from Montclair, who, who, who is active and who goes into the community. And there are rabbis, uh, Many rabbis who do this, but many rabbis who don't, because they are, don't want to come out on on And we should keep in mind that in the, in the 1960s, Dr. Kaplan was in his 80s. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Oh, Let's yeah. remember yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And notwithstanding that, the second part of the question for Dr. Heschel is: Did your father look to Kaplan as a partner at any time that you know of in civil rights advocacy? I think if Dr. Kaplan was, well, he was in his 80s at that point. My father wouldn't expect him to go to Selma and march in a demonstration, <laughs> obviously. It was already difficult for my father in his 60s to do things like that. Yeah. yeah although I have to note, since the, we're dedicating Congress in part to the memory of Jack Cohen, into his 90s, he was marching in East Jerusalem. Um, anyway, that's off the point. Um, I'm going to truncate the next question substantially, but I think I've got the essence of it from Mel. Did Kaplan have a problem with the metaphysical in general that we should all get over now? <laughs> well, the point is that Kaplan goes through um, different uh, moods. I use that uh, concept. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who I like so much um, and who inspires me, um, said, our moods do not know each other. And what he meant was, you know, that we're sad, we forget when we were happy, we're happy, we forget that when we were sad, we don't really feel it. Our moods do not know each other. And so what I wanted to do was to uh, um, indicate that theologically and philosophically um, that Kaplan is a man of moods, and that's why the diary is uh, the, the quintessential Kaplanian vehicle, because you get up today and you write about God, and God becomes... Um, uh, process and you write tomorrow and God becomes a, a, a reality which is very, very close to Heschel. Um, I, I want to read you um, uh, the essence of a poem um, that Kaplan wrote in the 1930s, uh, which is in my book, and it was published in the prayer book um, uh, that came out in uh, 1945, and I feel that it is I don't think it's a great poem, uh, but it is, it is Kaplan, it is pure Kaplan, it's not the adoption of anybody else, and it is a statement about his theology and his metaphysics, which I feel is important. Uh, it's called The Revelation of God in Nature. Uh, God is the oneness that spans the fathomless depths of space and the measureless eons of time, binding them together in act as we do in thought. He is in the sameness in the elemental substance of stars and planets, of this our earthly abode and all it holds. He is in the unity. He is in God is in the mystery of life. The mystery of life. I'm, I'm, I'm skipping here. Um, God is in the faith by which we overcome the fear of loneliness and helplessness of failure and of death. God is in the hope which, like a shaft of light, cleaves the dark abysms of sin. God is in the love which creates, pr protects, and forgives. He is in the spirit which broods upon the chaos men have wrought. And then he ends it with a <laughs> in, in a pure Heschelian mode. He says, Thou art my portion, O eternal. Thou art my share. Thou wilt show me the path of life. Fullness of joy is in thy presence. Everlasting happiness dost thou provide. So that's Kaplan's 
metaphysics and his religiosity. I want to conclude because we do really want to keep our emphasis on the future, so I have a perfect question broad for, either, uh, for both of you uh, to say a few words about, which is in light of um, all that you've said today and also your personal views, uh, what does each of you think about the, f specifically the question of the United States as a future home for non-Orthodox Judaism? You've talked a little bit about your concerns about vulgarization, but beyond that. Uh, well, we certainly don't seem to have too much uh, going on right now in Europe for liberal Jews. Uh, I find it uh, appalling that Judaism is being preserved like a museum uh, in synagogues that insist upon uh, an Orthodox service with men and women separated and so forth, even though nobody is Orthodox in the congregation. Uh, all over Europe with just an occasional so-called liberal synagogue, uh, and I think that's terrible. I just yesterday at my synagogue heard a talk about conversion in Israel and the outrageous corruption that goes on. With someone who converted 28 years ago all of a sudden loses the conversion because an angry husband wanting a divorce goes to the rabbi and says, oh, she's not really religious, and remove her certification as a Jew, and then of course that means her children aren't Jewish, et cetera. I don't think Israel at the moment is a place uh, to be a liberal Jew either, and I don't know when that's going to change. So America is the, is the place, and yes, I think uh, we do have a problem with the vulgarization and the lack of intellectual vitality and problems with Kavanaugh and so on, and that's why I'm glad that people are still reading Dr. Kaplan and my father, and perhaps also taking from them another piece of advice. These were two very sensitive human beings. They both had very rich inner lives. They both responded with great sensitivity to the circumstances they were in. They both were frequently very upset by their colleagues at the seminary, by their students, by the state of American Jewish life. And yet, and yet, they never despaired. Despair is a sin, my father used to say over and over. And they always were optimistic and they always maintained their faith, their convictions, and they kept on always struggling for their goals. And that's something we need to keep in mind. I suppose there is something very American about that, mm -hmm. this kind of optimism, as hope. Uh, but I am glad for that legacy that they leave us. Thank you. Thank you. If we stop there.